really bad note, but unfortunately, uh, Miss Leah uh, can't make it. She got held up, and I don't know. She's going to be here tomorrow. We have another one tomorrow. Uh, it sounded like it was just a hold up, and so she couldn't make it to this particular one. But everybody else is here. Yeah. Is here. So I want to go ahead and bring up our panelists. Uh, first of all, of course, you know Christopher Lloyd. I'm calling up uh, James Tolkien. Morning. <laughs> All right, we want to start this off with uh, questions and answers. Oh, oh, wait. We're good. Oh, okay, difference. I can keep hitting the wrong button. Now, um, there's still some holes in the aisles, and I don't want to have to interrupt our, our guests here again with this, so if you do have an empty seat, please hold your hand up until somebody's sitting next to you. We've got a lot of people who want to go and see these gentlemen, and I'm going to turn it over to them. Okay. Hand it off to these runners over here. Okay, uh, of course you guys know the parts they played in the Back to the Future movie. Uh, James uh, Strickland, the principal Strickland, uh, and Doc Brown. I don't really need to go any further than that. <laughs> but there's also a lot of other movies as well that they've done, uh, including a lot of the uh, independent work that uh, Mr. Lloyd is doing now. and. Uh, uh, Mr. Tolkien is now, just told me he did Phil Spector on HBO, it's going to be coming out. The movie producer that shot the lady in the face. <laughs> Interesting stuff. Uh, uh, could you tell me a little bit more about that? Oh, well, it's, uh, the Phil Spector movie is, I, I'm sure you've all heard of Phil Spector. He was the uh, famous music producer, The Wall of Sound was his, and he was... Uh, 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 he was convicted of having shot this woman in the mouth, who he picked up in a in a in a bar in uh, in Hollywood. And, but he was a he was a he's a genius in a way. Uh, the script is a crackling script by David Mamet, and it's starring Al Pacino and Helen Mirren. And uh, I'm playing a judge. Uh, the, the, it's a, the, my role is a, a relatively minor role, but I was very pleased to be in this very classy production. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, some of the independent stuff? What? Oh, I, um, I don't remember names offhand. I, <laughs> <laughs> you do them and, and you rap and you go home and hope you hear about them again. <laughs> but I've been uh, staying active, you know. Oh, we got it a little closer, I think. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I won't repeat all that, I, it, it's, uh, but I'm just, you know, continuing to work and, and do, grab everything that comes up. Yeah. And Does anyone have any questions about, uh, all right. Thank you. If anybody has any questions, please just line up right over here. If you are unable to line up, uh, sort of wave your hand like this, and we'll get to you as soon as we can. And then we'll send a runner out. What's going on? <laughs> we, we're lining up. Over here. We're here. Zombies. <laughs> the line for the brains is here. Go. go, you're number one. Um, 
I was just wondering what um, uh, Principal Strickland would say to both of you when you were in high school. What, what, would, what was the question, please? One more time. I was wondering what Principal Strickland would say to you both when you were in high school. Something about pr Principal Strickland I couldn't quite understand. Okay, could you tell us one more time? Ba basically, what would uh, Principal Strickland have said to y'all when y'all were in high school? Oh, what would he have said to like, you Like, what would his reaction to y'all be in high school? school? When I was in high school? What did you want to know about when I was in high school? <laughs> Well, in a, a certain, certain period in high school, I was a juvenile delinquent, I must say. Slacker. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, no, I was definitely a big-time big slacker my sophomore year. But then we, uh, we moved, and we moved from Evanston, Illinois, to Tucson, Arizona. And in Tucson, my entire life changed. I was, uh, I, 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 high school then became everything I wanted it to be. And uh, I continued on from high school, even to college. <laughs> and Mr. Lord? Ah, uh, yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, I guess she's asking, what kind of student are you? Oh, me. Uh, uh, <laughs> Good explanation. Yeah, I think that I, sums it up. I, um, I didn't really um, excel, uh, <laughs> and uh, it was a continual problem. My grade, I, I was not a disciplinary problem except for, you know, silly stuff, but um, academically I just couldn't seem to keep, keep my attention uh, on, on what was expected. And, uh, I, I actually, I never finished high school. It's good to have role models. <laughs> not, yeah, not a great role model, but um, <laughs> uh, fortunately, I chose a profession where diplomas are a necessity. <laughs> so I've survived. <laughs> All right. Let's get the next question over here. Hey guys, how you doing? I just want to tell you first, both you gentlemen are wonderful actors and thank you for all your hard work in the Back to the Future movies. Thank you. Uh, Christopher, this is for you. Two questions I wanted to ask you. First, what, what, what would you say are your similarities and differences when you are in Back to the Future and your role in Taxi? And second, who would you like to see in a Back to the Future remake if they did do it for you and Michael? So, what are the similarities between your taxi character and your Back to the Future, Doc Brown? Um, <laughs> not a lot <laughs> that I could think of. Uh, the, hair. Uh, the the hair. Uh, well, I'm not even sure if that applies. Um, they they came from two different worlds. Um, I certainly wouldn't have invented a time machine as as Reverend Jim. In my own head, maybe, yeah, you know, but it wouldn't have gotten off the ground. So, yeah, they were two very different guys, two very different guys. I recall him being kind of a genius, but he was hidden behind the drugs. Oh, yeah, that may be. He, he had his own distinctive outlook on things uh, due to uh, the loss of brain cells. <laughs> he, he saw things a little differently, but that, that was okay, don't I, we all? <laughs> I remember the episode where he was like the nerd. They showed him before the drugs, and then like the one drink, and it was like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> he found his future. <laughs> yeah. Nice. All right, next question. Um, this is for Mr. Lloyd. Um, I know you recently got to step back into the role of Doc Brown in the Back to the Future video game as a voiceover, and I also saw a, I think it was a commercial filmed in Argentina. Um, what was it like stepping back into the role after 25 years? Well, uh, it wasn't exactly like a film. Uh, it was a campaign for um, a, a chain of stores in Argentina which um, sell high-end electronic products. And, but they, they recre recreated the whole ambiance. Uh, DeLorean showed up down there and um, I was in full makeup and everything, and it was about a week shoot, and it was it was fun to get back there and, and do do something like that. 
So I don't know if anything will be seen of it in this country, but um, Argentina's certainly got their money's worth. So. <laughs> <laughs> I got a quick question, too. Did you guys keep any of the props from the movies? What? Did you keep any of the props from... Any of the props? Uh, no, uh, but I remember they gave us a Back Ooh, to well, the well. Future wristwatch. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's right. And I still have that. And, uh, and, and, a, and a few uh, delinquent slips to hand out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I did this movie, and all I got was a stinking watch. Is that what that yeah. <laughs> Can we get I, next? I have a, uh, uh, a, a, a yellow shirt with little trains all over it from the show that my dearest friend, whom, whom I'm very close to, does not let me wear. <laughs> it's, she's too embarrassed. This question is actually for both of you. Uh, Back to the Future is one of my favorite franchises, and I was wondering if you guys had any favorite franchises. I have difficulty understanding. Uh, uh, she wants to know if there's any Star other uh, franchises like Star Trek, uh, Back to the Future, that you are big fans of. Fans of? Yeah. Uh, not particularly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, not in that exactly the same way. Star, Star Wars, I guess, a little bit. But is it Star Trek or Star Wars? Um, both, both are good. <laughs> well, well, whatever. And, uh, <laughs> and um, I, I guess the, the Godfather series, uh, in another vein, pretty great. Good, good answer. Sir? All right. First off, I'd like to say both of you Christopher Lloyd and uh, Principal Strickland. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. It's what I know you from. Fan of what's his name? <laughs> you, every movie that I've seen both of you in has been wonderful, and I'd just like to say that thank you for being in the field that you are. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. What was the first part of that question? He likes you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My question is for both of you. I know that since Christopher Lloyd was involved in the Back to the Future game first season, would you both be willing to work on a second season if they do it? Uh, a second game? A second season, a yeah. Second game. Oh, sure. Yeah. And certainly, why not? Absolutely. Hi, guys. Um, my question for you kind of goes back for Christopher Lloyd, for the taxi character, and for Doc Brown. Where do you get your inspiration for such a zany character? Okay. Where did you get your inspiration for your zany taxi character? Um, I, and Doc. And Doc. Uh, and Doc. Um, well, well, Doc was kind of a creative and, and innovative genius, and, and I could not help but think of, of Albert Einstein. And a famous, a famous um, musical conductor back a while back named Leopold Stokowski. Um, he he did amazing things with classic pieces, and he was very exciting. And I had an album of his back in in the late fifties, and uh, all, this is of course uh, back in the day of of plastic records, you know. Um, believe me, they did exist. And, and on, on the album was a profile of Leopold Stokowski. He had, he had long white shock of hair and he had his baton up and he's conducting in the background was a whole picture of uh, the solar system. And um, th that image uh, I, I felt suited Doc Brown very well. Taxi character. Oh, taxi. Um, I, I mean, I kind of felt I understood the, what he was about when I got the script. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> uh, but every once in a while, we come back from a hiatus or a Christmas vacation, and I couldn't seem to get Reverend Jim in the groove again. I mean, I kind of lost him, and I. After that happened a few times, one time it happened, and my oldest brother, 
who's 22 years older than I, who's passed away a few years ago, and he was a total straight guy. He didn't smoke, didn't drink. Um, needless to say, he didn't do any other mind-altering things. And, but I, his face, he had a certain set way with his face, and I just think of that, and Reverend Jim would come right back. So um, I guess my brother had some kind of subliminal effect on my mind. This is a question for uh, Christopher Lloyd. Um, huge fan of your work, sir. And um, you played so many over-the-top characters, like obviously Doc Brown, uh, Uncle Fester, Judge Doom. And which was your favorite character of all of these, and why that you ever played? Uh, I I don't know. I, I they're my each one is my favorite when I'm doing it. Um, I must say with, with uh, Uncle Fester, I grew up on Charles Adams cartoons uh, as a kid. And Uncle Fester was one of my favorites. Uh, I, and I mean, it's like for years I would follow it. Then later on, I, I, I forgot about it. Then years later, maybe decades later, I got a call to be Uncle Fester. And I was like, blew me away. Yeah, I did that, this character that I had so involved with, uh, I end up having the, the privilege of playing later on. Although when I first got the offer. I didn't quite understand how it was going to work out because I'm not very fat and uh, I don't have a round head, but, but we worked it out. Uh, this question is for both of y'all. Um, I wanted to know what initially made, made y'all decide that y'all wanted to do Back to the Future? What, uh, what made you really want to do Back to the Future? Well, that's kind of a long answer. I, uh, most of us there actually were New York actors. We worked in the theater in New York, and uh, I was acting in a play on Broadway, and I had always said, I'm never going to Hollywood until somebody sends for me. And I was doing a play on Broadway, and I got the call from Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale. They had seen a movie I was in called Prince of the City, and they just offered me the part. And uh, that's what brought me to L.A., and then I stayed there for quite a few years, had a good time, and uh, here we are now. <laughs> Still laughing and scratching. Well, I was eager to get uh, any work that might come along. I remember I was doing a play. Um, I, I, no, I was, wasn't doing a play. I was doing a, a movie uh, you know, that has, has never been released in Mexico. And <laughs> yeah, and and I got an offer to go back to New York, where I felt my roots were in the theater. I got an offer to go back and do a play, and it had a, a, a wonderful cast. And I was going to be playing Hans Christian Andersen. And I thought this is what I should be doing instead of meddling around in Hollywood, you know, and and not you know. And I was going to go back to do that. And while I was shooting, I got the script was mailed to me for Back to the Future, and I kind of, I didn't even read it. I literally chucked it in the waste paper basket. <laughs> literally. Yeah. How insane can you be, you know? <laughs> and a friend of mine who was with me at the time knows that I'd always said that I, I, I'm never going to leave any stone unturned. I mean, anything that comes up, you check out. And that seemed reasonable, and so I pulled it out, and I read it, and I went back and met Bob Zemeckis, and I just fell in love with it. You know, I just, I really loved uh, my, my feelings about Bob Zemeckis, and I got into the script, and that's, that was that. I realized this, you know, you know great, a great role for me. Uh, um, did I and on the suit on the, on the uh, movies um you had a biff in the past and a biff in the future but why, where was marty's biff oh huh needles <laughs> no no he was in the future though and because he had a grandpa so where was marty's biff for his generation needles needles no? needles uh asked and okay. answered <laughs> Uh, one more time. Say it one more time, okay. slowly. Now, <clears throat> now, 
when Marty went to school, he didn't have a biff, right? Because he, he had a biff yes, in the past did. for his father, and he had a biff in the future for his son. Where was Marty's biff? For Where the, was Marty's the second, biff? For the second generation. I'd say needles. Yeah. 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 That was needles. He almost got him to lose his hand. His hand. His whole career, man. Thank you very much. I, I, uh, That's it. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I, I just wanted to ask a question to uh, Christopher Lloyd. First of all, first start off with a statement. I love both characters, uh, Reverend Jim and uh, Doc Brown. I can watch them endlessly. Um, Two-part question. The first one, when you were working on the on the Back to the Future movie, how much control did you have over input to the character? Like, was, was there a lot of improvisation, a lot of elements that you brought to the character that were not on the written page? And also, what was it like to film the two movies back to back? Um, I, I, I don't remember improvising dialogue very much. It was pretty much exactly as written. And uh, Doc Brown had so many convoluted speeches about the space-time continuum and this and that. I could never have made that up. <laughs> and so it, it stuck. Um, maybe there was an instance here and there where a lot, you know, a lot, but it was pretty much as Bob Gale wrote it. And um, it amazes me when you watch interviews with politicians and people who get three or four part questions and they remember each one. What was that? What was it like to go back to back? Oh, was it like uh, well, we, we did Back to the Future One, and then there was about a two month, a two year interval um, before we did two and three together. I think we had about a three week break between them. And it was good. I mean, I just, it was focused, you know, you stayed in character and all that. And, and um, I don't know that they intended to make two and three. I, I, <laughs> um, never mind. <laughs> no, because I, I, cause they had a very thick script for number two. And I think there was some uncertainty and they've, about how they're going to get all that in. And so they decided to make three. I mean, but, you know, before we started two, and so they did two and three. Um, but I liked it that way. You know, I, it was a long time between one and two, so it was nice to do them both, just keep focused on it. <clears throat> Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, in October of 2010, uh, Back to the Future celebrated 25 years, so congratulations on that. <laughs> And uh, there was an excellent party on the east side of Manhattan to celebrate. I hope you guys had a good time. Uh, uh, but uh, my question is this. Uh, you know, being part of a franchise that still has power after now 26 years, do you find that you're more grateful to be part of something that's so culturally strong? Or do you find yourself more challenged to get your other roles noticed? Uh, uh, <laughs> did you say, do we find ourselves grateful? For the fact that it's been such a success, well, absolutely. And what was the next part of that question? Or, or, or do you prefer the stuff that you're doing now to it? In other words, uh, this was a great success, but do you rather be known for the stuff that you're doing now than the, the one-time thing? Oh, as, as long as we're known <laughs> at all. <laughs> I, um, I, I think it's incredible that it's going on this tw in 26 years. I, I meet parents who have children, and the parents saw the film when they were children, and now their children are seeing it. And it just keeps rolling along, and, and it doesn't seem to be losing much momentum. You know, I, It's great to be, and, and I know from people that come up to me from time to time, that it's a film they, they say with all sincerity changed their lives. And so it's an incredible thing to be part of something that's meant a lot to a lot of people, you know, so it's wonderful. And I, I you know, um, I get scripts now and then, and it's like a spin-off of Doc Brown, and, and sometimes I, it's okay, and sometimes I don't want to do the same thing, but I'm not regretful at all uh, about, Back to the Future's 
continuing success. You know, I love what I, I, I love the other stuff I'm doing and I don't feel any conflict. And if, if I could add something to that, you know, myself, I'm, you know, an, I'm an actor in the theater and I can't tell you how many plays, about 30 years acting in theater in New York. And I don't know if anybody will ever remember any of the plays I did, but this, these movies just are, they just go on in perpetuation. Yeah. Let me ask you, do you guys, do you guys ever get to work, do you guys ever get to work with the, uh, any of the cast in any of your other works that you're doing now? Do you ever get to root, you know, get back with anybody? Well, uh, Michael J. Fox directed me in uh, Tales of the Crypt, which was great fun. <laughs> which, which, which was great fun. And other than that, I haven't worked with any other cast members, except I'm very pleased to be with Christopher Lloyd at any time. And uh, here we are. <laughs> um, I've worked a few times with Leah Thompson, who uh, we all noticed doesn't seem to be here this morning. <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll, you know, see about that. But um, she will be here tomorrow, I understand. I mean, she's here, but she's not here. But I've worked, I don't know, other than that, um, whether I, I've worked with Bob Sebeckis in, in, in another Tales, no, in a, some horror thing, Head of the Class, something like that. <laughs> But it, we love horror. Yeah. Which one of the three movies was your personal favorite to be involved in, and can you explain why? <laughs> well, I, I think the first one because it was uh, it was the uh, it was the most exciting, and nobody thought it was going to be particularly thought that it was going to be such a big movie, such a big hit, 25 years later. And uh, so I think the first would be my favorite. Um, I, I, I like the third the best. <laughs> yeah, I, there was horseback riding, you know, it was the West, it was the West horseback riding and working on that steam engine, which um, I, I don't suppose many of you have had an opportunity to do that, but it's a, it's a real kick. Um, <laughs> It's, a, it's an amazing apparatus, and, and being on it, working on it is great. The horseback riding, and I had a romance. And uh, those of you who have followed my career know there's damn few of those. <laughs> so I was grateful. I was grateful for that. Let me ask you, I, I actually worked for a place where I did some, I had to learn how to ride a horse, and I really was unsuccessful at it. Uh, Nine-foot Frisian horse, and uh, it's very comical. Uh, how did you guys? Did you do horses before this? Have you ever ridden? Yeah, I, I've ridden enough, so I felt comfortable with it. Uh, I remember there was a time when when Doc is chasing the train. He's chasing the train and and sort of galloping alongside of it, and he reaches over and pulls himself onto the train. That part I was not permitted to do. Um, <laughs> But a stuntman did it, and they, you know. But I was on one take. I was racing along, and I was within arm's reach of that handle on the train, and I so wanted to go for it. <laughs> but you know, if it didn't work out, it would have been kind of calamitous. So I didn't. The one-armed Christopher Lloyd. How about you? Well, in my case, uh, it just so happens. My father and my grandfather were both in the horse business, so I grew up with horses. So I'm, I'm, used, I'm familiar. I'm, be, I like, I'm comfortable being around horses, and I know how to handle horses. So that was no problem. So yeah, just me then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, this first part is for Christopher. Um, I just wanted to let you know that your role as Jim in Taxi actually greatly affected my life. Um, I know you would. I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean it in a good way, and it was very touching, and I wanted to get the opportunity to tell you this, but the um, episode, Jim's Inheritance, um, my mom took the song, Sunshine of My Life, and she, every time she hears it, she thinks of me, and it was because of that particular episode. Um, so I just wanted to let you know about that, and it was really touching. And the second one's for James. 
Can you call me a slacker, please? <laughs> Did you say talk a little louder? Um, um, I, James, can you call me a slacker? Oh, call her a slacker. <laughs> Are there any slackers in this room? <laughs> well, to those, of, to those of you who uh, fit that description, you're a slacker. Give my best to your mom. We'll get you that phone number later. All right. This, uh, this question is for both of you. Uh, you were both in visually groundbreaking movies uh, separately. One was Star Trek III, directed by Leonard Nimoy. And Mr. Tolkien, you were in Dick Tracy, directed by Warren Beatty. And I wanted, I wanted to ask both of you if you could talk a little bit about, in your case, Mr. Lloyd, what it was like being directed by Leonard Nimoy, and Mr. Tolkien, if you could tell me what it was like working with Warren Beatty. Well, um, I was always, I still am, a bit um, baffled why at that point moment in time I was asked to do um, um, uh, uh, Captain Krug. Um, I, I was not a, a, I was not a fan or not a, a fan. I just didn't follow Star Trek and I didn't know what I had done that convinced Leonard Nimoy that I would, uh, you know, make it as Captain Krug. Um, he was wonderful to work with. Uh, very patient, very very intelligent, and of course he knew he knew the material um, very very well. And I loved doing it. I mean, I just even even though I was coming in at, at three four o'clock in the morning to put all that makeup on, I loved wearing it, and I loved the costume and and all that stuff. And this guy was so evil, and and you know he didn't have anything in his DNA that had to do with compassion or, uh, you know, guilt or con... He had no conscience about just, you know, um, blowing everybody up for his own ends, you know. So it was a, it was a joy. It was good work. <laughs> As far as Warren Beatty is concerned, Warren Beatty is one of the first people I met when I arrived in New York. We were in the same acting class with Stella Adler, and uh, I knew Warren all those years. And then when I was called out to Hollywood to do Back to the Future, uh, I, I was invited out to his house, and they talked about doing this movie, Dick Tracy. And he asked me if I wanted to be in it, and I said, it'd be great, why not? I think, I think every actor in Hollywood uh, was, would be pleased to, to be part of that movie. And as far as Warren is concerned, he's a fantastic director and a, and a fabulous person. And you just can't imagine, you couldn't be possibly treated any better than working on that production. Um, my first part was just to Christopher Lloyd that um, I would like to say you're an amazing actor. Both of y'all are actually amazing actors. You're a great character actor and the bad guy in Who Framed Roger Rabbit kind of freaked me out a little bit, <laughs> but um, in a cool, bizarre way. But um, my question is, when doing Back to the Future, um, did you enjoy doing the more the, the futuristic type stuff or the, the past? Or was it kind of a combination that you liked them both? Or? Um, I, I, I didn't make any particular distinction because I'm, I was Doc Brown in the past, the future, the present. He's the same guy, um, so it, it, it didn't make too much difference. I, f I feel uh, maybe I could have said more, but I can't think of it. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I have a question for Mr. Tolkien. Um, you were in several episodes of one of my favorite television shows of all time. You were Norman Keyes on Remington Steel. <laughs> And I had to get up and say something to you, mainly to let you know that when I get home and call my mom and tell her who all I saw at Dragon Con, and I tell her I was in the same room with the dude who chased Remington Steele out of this country, 
she is gonna plot. <laughs> Um, my, my question is for both of you. First, well, first, uh, I really love both of your work. I've enjoyed watching you in a lot of movies. Uh, and I was wondering what was your least, for both of you, what was your least favorite location to shoot on? Well, um, a couple of years ago, uh, they made a, remi a remake of Piranha, Piranha 2 or whatever, something like that. <laughs> And their location was in Arizona, in, in eastern Arizona, on a lake. And it was so hot. And I, I, I didn't suffer like the others. I had, I was, had an interior shooting, but it, I, I just don't know how people function. Uh, people who live there, it was just so hot. I, I, and it made, it, it made everything kind of miserable. So I... I, that to me was the uh, most uncomfortable location. Did you want a question, an answer from me on that? Well, it's similar. Uh, very early in my career, I happened to be doing a, a training film for the Army, and it was in, uh, in, in Baltimore on some base. And again, we were filming in some little shack, and it was oppressively hot. And I just wanted to get out of there. <laughs> and I think, I think it's, my feeling was very similar to what Chris suggested. As far as uh, Back to the Future is concerned, what were your favorite scenes? Well, you know, I liked... Uh, I, I'll answer that first, if you don't mind. I like... My favorite scene was confronting Marty Fly in the hall and saying, you know, your father was a slacker and there, no, no McFly is ever going to mount anything in the history of Phil Valley and you're going to be a slacker too. And that was my favorite moment. <laughs> um, I, I guess the, uh, a scene in Back to the Future 3 where there's a, a dance at night uh, and yeah... Uh, uh, they, they had, uh, I'm sure you all know, I imagine, uh, ZZ Top. And, and they made up the band, uh, including a few local people. And, uh, and it was, I think, two night, all night shoots. There was a dancing with Clara and, uh, um, and other, other f fun things. But between takes while they might be resetting the lights or whatever. The ZZ Top. The, the two guys <laughs> would play and it was such a treat. It was such a treat. It's uh, one of those really f fun, mo fun moments, you know. So. Uh, just wanted to thank you guys for uh, being here. I think it's very awesome uh, to be part of Dragon Con. Uh, you both, in the uh, first movie, had the opportunity to work with uh, Crispin Glover. And um, was there any indication while working with him that, the, well, everybody knows whatever controversies happened afterwards uh, with Mr. Glover. Was there any indication that you got while working with him that he might not be along for the, the whole ride should there be more of a ride? Are you, are you asking if they knew he was crazy? <laughs> Uh, no, I, I didn't have any inkling. Um, uh, of course, we, we didn't know we were going on to do two and three, but um, uh, he just seemed like Crispin Glover. <laughs> sort of. I didn't read that he's crazy. I, yeah. Hello, I have a question for both of y'all. Um, I wanted to know what was the difference between acting in a play and a movie? And uh, which one do you prefer better? Well, having spent so many years in the theater, I like, I really prefer the theater because you get weeks of rehearsal and previews, you get to work and develop the character. And very often in movies, you, uh, you don't have that kind of time unless you're working with a director who takes the time to rehearse. So um, my preference would be working in the theater. 
Yeah, I, I, I think I'd have to say the same thing. Um, I go back and do a, I start out in the theater for a long time, um, and going back and doing a play um, is like going home. It's like going back to where, where it all began. And you can't beat um, having a live audience out there, you know? So, and, and uh, it's, as I've heard some people say, it's a little bit like walking on a tightrope because you're in front of an audience, you can't stop if you goof up. You gotta go all the way through and, and it's, it's a special experience, so I guess, I, you know. I got a question for both of y'all, by the way. Uh, Chris Alloy, you're a great role model in Camp Nowhere. <laughs> um, what was it like um, working in Back to the Future movies with Michael J. Fox and Leah Thompson and the other cast members? Like, any particular offset between behind the scenes moments that stand out to you? Um, I, uh, what are you, you're asking? Uh, uh, any particular scenes working with them that stand out to you? What was your favorite scene with those people? Oh, um, hmm, uh, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, most of my scenes were, were with Marty, and they were always on my, I mean, we just had a good chemistry and, and things fell into place real easy. Um, and um, I, didn't, I, I hardly had any scenes with Leah and the bad guy, um, what, Biff. Um, <laughs> he, he was fun to work with, you know, as well. So I, it was a very harmonious group. I don't, did we ever have a scene? We had not a scene, no, no, only oh. off stage. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> and we won't get into that. Gentlemen, also, I wish to thank you for being here. We greatly appreciate you taking time out of your schedules. Uh, some of my favorite roles for both of you are really not the, the big hit or mainstream movies. Mr. Lloyd, John Big Booty, or Big Boote, in Buckaroo Banzai, and Mr. Tolkien in um, uh, Top Gun, Sly, uh, Stinger, Stinger in Top Gun, and... Um, Lubbock in the uh, Masters of the Universe movie. Uh, my question is, of your notoriety, what has been the best and worst that has happened to you because of your notoriety? I think, I think the very best is the fact that we're sitting here right in this room with you. And, and, the, and the worst is when you do an audition and they don't hire you. I, I can't improve on that. That's... Ditto. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, gents, how's it going? Thanks very much for being here. It's been said by so many people, but I just wanted to repeat that. Uh, my question was, um, what was it like the on set but off camera dynamic working with Steven Spielberg and Michael J. Fox and all the rest of those talented actors and actresses. What was the the chemistry, the dynamic like off the like off the camera? Well uh, when you're off camera during a scene um, you, you want to try to give as much as you gave when you were on camera for the sake of, of your partner. And um, that, that's really what that's all about. Once in a while you get into an occasion where the other actor doesn't even show up. And that's kind of annoying. Um, but yeah, you want to give what they gave you when you were off camera, you know, the a performance. It's hard to get it up as, as quick. Rephrase. <laughs> Hard to do that as <laughs> as keenly as when you are on camera because you, there's a certain amount of you know the juices are going you know. 
Just continue. Just go with it. Just go with it. Next question. This is for Christopher Lloyd. Um, you mentioned being in other movies with Leah Thompson. I just wondered what it was like being Switchblade Sam in Dennis the Menace. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes. Um, that was another unnice guy that I uh, enjoyed playing. I remember I had a reach over, uh, there's a point there where there's a little boy in a backyard and I'm skulking along, coming along and I had a big knife and the little kid's eating an apple I, and took it away and that child could not get near me whether I was in or out of makeup. I mean like, as, uh, he would not come any closer than you are. He, he, he'd be hugging his mom's legs, you know, he just, and I, and I tried, I tried to be the nice guy that I am, and in, unsuccessfully. Uh, hi, Mr. Lloyd, Mr. Shulkin, thanks again for coming out and uh, talking with us today. Uh, I had a question about Red Dawn, uh, either you guys want to take that? No. Uh, but uh, uh, actually, my question was for you, Mr. Lloyd, uh, in uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, uh, you played Judge Doom, and I was, uh, you know, as a kid, I must have, I wore the VHS of that video out. Uh, I watched it so many times. But my question was, that was really a cutting edge film as far as humans working with animation. There hadn't really been anything like that before. What were some of the difficulties in, in making that film? What was hard about doing Roger Rabbit? Um, probably scenes where you, were, where you had to work with, uh, with the toon characters, which of course were there. Uh, but we would rehearse before they, they like like the, there was a, uh, a, a Roger Rabbit. They had a Roger Rabbit that had real weight, and um, you know you could hold and fuss with. And they had a, uh, a, a person trained in, in body movement and how you use your muscles to lift things or whatever. So we practiced with a dummy rabbit and and uh, rehearse with it, and then. We try to remember what we did, you know, physically, to to give the feeling of weight, so that during a take, when the when there was no rabbit there, um, we were able to make it look like we were still, uh, you know, we still had that in our hands. I guess that was probably the the most difficult part. You're welcome. Um, this question is also from Mr. Lloyd. Um, recently you had a brief run on a little sci-fi television show called Fringe and um, remember you played a character that had themes very similar to Back to the Future. I was just wondering how you felt going into that role even though it wasn't Back to the Future. Uh, Fringe, I was uh, like a musician. Yeah. Um, I didn't... I, I felt from, he came from a different place than Doc Brown. Um, I would have thought he'd be a little closer to River Jim, but I didn't. I didn't want to. I didn't want to remind anybody of anything. I just felt that that was a character in its own right, and trying to really make it work well. And I loved working on the show, and and doing that part. It was a wonderful cast to work with too. Hi, this is for James. Um, I was curious if you got to ride in one of the jets when you were filming Top Gun, and if so, how did that go? <laughs> did you get to ride in any of the jets during Top Gun? Oh, in, not in the jets, no. No, no, we, we, were, uh, we were in some kind of uh, transportation plane where they transported us onto the USS Enterprise, but only a few actors got to get up in the jets. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hi, my question's for uh, Mr. Tolkien as well. Uh, my friends and I are huge fans of Top Gun, like really awesome. But I wanted to know, uh, is there something from that movie that you really took as an experience that you really enjoy, like a blooper or just in general, like seeing the jets, ooh, jets. Oh, you know, Top Gun, you know, when you do a movie, you, really don't, you never really know how it's going to be and how it's going to turn out. But everybody on Top Gun felt positive that this was going to be a big hit and it turned out that that was that was right but that's an exception i promise you all right 
right. Um, recently on Auction Kings, they auctioned off an exact replica of the DeLorean time machine. Would you ever have the chance, if they ever made another one, would you actually buy it? If they made another DeLorean, would you buy it? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, the stunt drivers on the show uh, that would drive it um, and you know really kind of push it uh, said that it was not a well-engineered car. <laughs> it, it looked great for the film, but. And they, I think they had about six or seven DeLoreans on the set all the time, and they'd be taking them apart from this one and apart from that one, to mix it up. So it wasn't engineered that well. And the, the damn few service stations across the country. Thank you for your question. Thank you. And with that, I think we're going to call that a wrap. And I would like to thank our guests. Uh, thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We'll be back here tomorrow. What time? Four o'clock tomorrow. There'll be another one. Same place. We'll see you guys then. Have a good one.